Hey there gamers, welcome back to PSN Previews, the show where I rate and review 10 PSN games at a time, while also telling you just what to expect from the trophy chase. For this list, I tried out a bunch of games I'd never even heard of before. As an added plus, the guides say these can all be completed in less than an hour, with nothing registering above a 2 on the difficulty scale. Anyway, let's get into the games. Number 1 Balance a lot. I play a lot of the Trials games for fun, and this game immediately reminded me of what it's like to drive the donkey in Trials Fusion. Only here, you also have a lance attached to your front which bounces about at will causing all sorts of chaos. That's my long-winded way of warning you away from this game. <laughs> It's hard to control the way Tony Hawk's manuals are after 10 seconds or so, if you also had a dog randomly trying to bite you while you tricked on the track. The music is grating, the visuals are bland, and this experience was obviously made by trolls. Guide wrongly calls this 3 for difficulty a 1. For some players it may even be upward of a 4. The fact that it's short doesn't mean it automatically gets a difficulty pass, I'm sorry, but that's the reality this 15 minute clear was for me, a physics platformer experienced gamer mind you, a frustrating slog. There are at least checkpoints and a few simplified workarounds for the greater challenges. If you choose to chase this plat, know that you have to beat level 1, collect 1 star, kill 1 lion, kill 10 snails, and die 20 times. So beat the first stage, then visit level 22 of Spooky Island to quickly get a lion kill. And if you missed getting a star in a stage, which is probable, try getting the star at the start of stage 2. But you should know that I don't recommend this plat. It has less than 86% completion for good reason. That may sound like a high completion rate for you, but do keep in mind that the guide's claiming this is a 1 for difficulty that's only going to eat 10 minutes of your time. That's unrealistic. Plat clears on this sort of greasy are usually well above 90%. In short, unless you enjoy games where you're meant to fail needlessly, this one sucks. But there is at least a good amount of content if you're one of the few who end up liking this. Special note that my comparison to Trials shouldn't lead you to conclude this is anywhere close to the same level of quality or fun. Accidental hilarity is the best you can hope for here. Number 2 Mages and Treasures. This is yet another game set in the reused worlds of Super Boxland Demake and Milo's Quest, only this is the least interesting and worst controlling of them all. It's actually near identical to the setup of Milo's Quest, but the combat isn't as well done, you get hung up a lot more, and there's simply not as much charm. You're essentially adventuring about, solving pressure plate puzzles, battling enemies, collecting coins, keys and pickups, and making your way to the next boss. But that all sounds much cooler than it ends up being. Atop this, the trophy guide had me expecting a 15 minute clear when it took closer to 25. And the difficulty is a 2, not a 1, just because of how involved it ends up being. Be sure to turn on easy mode in the settings. I definitely liked that you just had to find boss number 2, not beat him for a trophy. Though I admittedly downed him anyway because I didn't realize that. Call it my only hurrah in a boring game where you're tasked with collecting 100 coins and kills, picking up one of each type of character boost, and solving 5 puzzles in addition to reaching the second boss. Unlike Milo's Quest, I was more than happy to put this down, and these puzzles were a clunky joke compared to Super Boxland D-Make. You can easily see why this is lesser known than the others. It's easy to do, and there's more game to be played beyond the plat, but the coolest thing about this game is its name. Number 3 Loop Index this reminded me of another puzzler I played called Ken Duo. That, however, was the superior game. And that's mostly down to how unreliable some of the moves in this game can be, as well as how easy it is to trap yourself. If you like semi-challenging puzzlers though, this one has more meat on the bones than Ken Duo did, in addition to more content. Another positive here is that the game is two-player. Trophies won't unlock at all for the second player though, albeit it does move things along faster if you're playing that way. None of the dumb guides I saw mention this, nor do they accurately portray the time to plat or the difficulty. This is going to take you about two hours to finish. An hour if you're playing with a second player. And the difficulty's a three, since most of these puzzles really do force you to think through their resolves. It's a sloppy controlling but well thought out puzzler. I plan to play it with my son, but that's probably the only reason I could see for replaying it. There's at least one boss encounter and content beyond the plat, but even the main loop mechanic feels pretty busted at times, so it's a difficult one to recommend in spite of its pros. Number 4 Rayflector. This one was tough to rate. On one hand, there is an objective here, a few actually, assuming you're a completionist or a trophy chaser. On the other hand, almost nothing about this is good, 
What it ends up being is vague, half-cocked, and empty beyond reaching the end of the first and only stage. I could, maybe, big maybe, see some kind of gamer looking to best their previous clear time. Problem there is that the one-dimensionality of the puzzle doesn't make for anything interesting or worthwhile. It's so dull, in fact, that you can see just how many players put this down based on the completion rate when it should be a 95 plus percent game. What with there only being a single stupid stage? The issue is that you're left trying to guide this ray to the end, but have really sad options for getting it there. Eventually, you'll realize there's only one way to go through most of it, and the previous ways you've messed up are still bouncing around the map, fogging your ability to see the solution clearly. All you've got to do to get the plat is touch every ball and button. Doesn't have to be at the same time either. The guide correctly calls it a 2, though the frustration factor for some will probably make it a 3. And it took my half-broken epileptic brain about 10 minutes to clear. But those were 10 bad minutes, which I wouldn't wish upon any but the most fervent of trophy hunters. For the rest of you, this is best left in obscurity. It is, after all, a game so poorly thought out that its name appears as reflection when you're looking at the trophy list. Number 5. B Cannon. This is a game where you only push one button and try to reach the highest score you can. Tapping X switches your direction, while holding X stops your character and shoots once, changing your direction again once you let go of the button. It's very reminiscent of something which would have been considered a fun high score game in the days of Atari. And it also requires a bit of finesse to play well, but since you can't control the directionality of your shots, the game actually chooses those for you. And since not every on-screen ring increases your score when shot, it's tough to recommend as a fun experience experience for those who like this sort of game. The best I could say is that it's okay at best, and only a matter of time before the auto-aim ruins your flow state experience. Trophy-wise, I'd call the difficulty here a 3 personally, since the 500 points trophy isn't cumulative, and it takes a bit of serious gamer skill to reach that point. It indeed took me 10-15 to 15 minutes to obtain though, so guide got that right. The real positive here is that the score really starts to snowball after you hit 100 points. The only other trophy you have to worry about is surviving for 2 minutes. For the points trophy, just try to survive in a single corner, firing every time you turn, basically moving as little as possible unless it helps your rhythm to survive among the bouncing enemies. After this, the two minute survival is a breeze. Either just keep turning on one side without firing at all, or hold the X button down right at the beginning to stop your movement altogether. Since the enemy in the middle will only move up and down, you're simply waiting out the two minutes. It's a quick plat, which I'd recommend to most gamers. Just know that a handful of players are apt to struggle much more with developing the 500 point skill and having what one might call a lucky run. Number 6 Takotan in this side-scrolling shooter, you play as what I'm guessing is a rubber duck fused with an octopus? It makes no sense, but it's clear the dev was going for an NES-style shooter with Mega Man-esque visuals and power-ups, as well as a boss at the end of all eight stages. The problem is that it's fairly lackluster to play. You tank quite a bit of damage, making survivability a constant concern, even with assist mode on. Until you've reached the boss, you can count on death sending you back to the start of a stage, and if you lose all of your lives, you're starting over from scratch at the very beginning of the game. Wouldn't be an issue if the stages didn't get so stale so fast in terms of their delivery. Even though you have jewels to grab for weapon change power-ups, an invincibility dodge, changing visuals between levels, health cakes to grab, and a barrage of enemies and obstacles, it doesn't stop the experience feeling mostly bland and repetitive. Plus, none of this makes any sense, so you'll be hard-pressed to care about what you're doing. The plat chase is simple, but on the long side for a greasy. I agree with the guide's difficulty rating of a 3, however, this did take me just over an hour to plat. Beating 6 normal stages is time consuming as it is, but then you've the 250 diamonds trophy to contend with, assuming you already got all the different trophies for picking up various colors of diamonds, food items, etc. Having played 2 stages normally before turning assist mode on, which wiped my progress in the stages I'd add, I simply played the game again from the start and had the last trophy around the middle of stage 8. The game's ending was a dud, but it might feel good to see the ending if you go this far. It's a wacky yet half-decent experience, which I can't recommend to you because of its dull runtime, but if you've run out of really short plats and like space shooters, there are far worse games than Takotan. Number 7 Orbibot. I am quite sad to admit that this game controls atrociously. Even after lots of fiddling with the settings, it just always felt bad to control. Part of that's owed to how easy it is to fall off rails here, but things are also programmed sloppily. 
A good example is how you can't move in certain directions when the camera is directly overhead. Atop this, the puzzles are asinine and there are some glitches to contend with. I hit one on the triple ball puzzle in level 3 anyway, making this purported 10 minute clear take me 45 minutes in total the first time through. Yes, 45 minutes to complete 3 pretty short stages? That's the lacking level of polish we're talking about. My recommendations are to go into settings, turn off all video effects, slide sensitivity all the way to the right, and slide zoom speed all the way to the left. You may also want to invert the camera's X control. This should give you the best leg up. If you master the controls somehow and are keen on working out this mess, there's at least more content for you beyond the plat. I appreciated the visual style as well as the music, but this was an immediate uninstall sort of game for me. The guide gives it a 1 for difficulty where I'd call it a 3, and I think the realistic timeline to plat would be 20 minutes if you hit no glitches. Beat 3 levels, grab 3 cat collectibles, knock a bunch of crap off the platforms, then hit the 2 balls off the platform at the start of stage 4, and you should have a new shiny. It's not something I wanted to do again, but did anyway since I got copies for 2 different systems when buying. Second pass took me about 10 minutes. Absolutely one I'd only recommend playing for the trophies, and even then only because of the low clear time. Number 8 Black Wolf Gotta be real honest here, I don't know where this game goes, if anywhere, and I don't care. I also hate giving a rating this low to something that's not void of reasons to play, but from a quality standpoint, a 1 is what this game deserves. You might think by looking at the on-screen footage that I'm just a very, very bad gamer. However, the reality is that this game controls poorly, has garbage hitboxes, and offers up a continuous string of the cheapest deaths I've ever experienced in a game. It's so predictable after a few minutes that it's not even funny. You just know the next screen will begin with a fall into spikes. Seemingly, the only way the devs could make putting up with their shitty game's progression was to add checkpoints every two or three jumps. There's more beyond what it takes to plat this title, but I'll be damned if I take the time to discover what exactly that consists of. My guess is just more of the same. Once you've cleared a few screens, you've played this game. No boss battle or change of scenery is going to fix that. Luckily, the trophy chase is short, if bittersweet. I'd agree with the 2 out of 10 for difficulty, but might count on 10 minutes to clear instead of 5 if you aren't spamming most of the deaths up front, which is what I recommend, even though you'll die plenty, it's faster than tracking the rest when you could just spam deaths right out of the gate. And the rest is just 18 checkpoints and 20 bones collected. Between wall jumps and square for air dashes, this shouldn't give you enough trouble to be noteworthy of challenge, annoying is what the game primarily is, making clear that this one's obscure for a good reason. Number 9 Why Pizza? It's not the greatest stretch to say I was pleasantly surprised by this game, if only for the weird laughs it gave me alongside its frustrations and controlling. This is one of those games with shitty on purpose controls, your own head gets in your way and there are a handful of confusing yet helpful mechanics introduced along the way. You also get more powerful as you go along, allowing you to destroy lava, be slung like a slingshot, etc. The thing that's really holding this one back is the sheer number of jump fails, and movement woes in general. I'm not sure how much of the game remains to be seen beyond the plat, but I could see turning it back on here and there just to find out. It's lacking a ton of expected depth by modern standards, but often gives throwback vibes to titles like Earthworm Jim or Toe Jam and Earl, clearly if they'd been mixed with the design concepts of a game like Octodad. It's not very good in the general sense, but it is goofy enough to be entertaining, and I could see lots of folks laughing while watching you play this one. So it's certainly among the few games in this video which shouldn't be so unknown, and the trophy chase is super straightforward. Just reach level 14, and the plat is yours. Still, go into this platinum run anticipating some hardships in the beginning. There's a shop between stages where you should absolutely be buying things like extra pins and shields whenever you can, as they'll trivialize the second half of the chase. Click the right stick to swing the shovel once you have it. Know that you can move your head, kind of, with left or right on the right stick. Otherwise, you'll probably pick up on the text prompts for how to pin your head, eventually be able to dash, etc. It's something I'd call a 3 for difficulty, and it took me 35 minutes to complete blindly. I recommend it to trophy hunters, even if it's a bit shit. Fact is, it's an oddly good time. Number 10 Thunder Honestly, I like most of what this is, and for two reasons. Firstly, the RNG design of the lightning seems fair, and secondly, it's fun for old school high score chasers. Unfortunately, that's about all there is here. 
Your only goal as a gamer is reaching a new high score. It would have been nice if there were also a longest time survived counter in display, but since you can usually cheese the corners for long survival, I get why that aspect was left out. So in this game, every time you press X, your character's direction changes. You want to avoid touching the lightning strikes, but also want to quickly collect what's on the ground after the strikes. The larger the lightning, the more you pick up, and the more your score snowballs. It's simple to understand and a bit tough to master with the occasional unfair bolt based on pure RNG. Luckily, for the purposes of the trophy chase, this thing is the breeze the guide claims it to be. The two minute survival trophy was the last I unlocked, and it agitated my thumb a bit, ducking and dodging in the corners, but after a few tries saw it done, along with the score of a thousand and the ten required deaths. No missables, and I must admit, I'm surprised this one isn't talked about more often. Warts and all. It's grubby, coming in fast with only a mild challenge, but I mostly enjoyed the small amount of time I spent chasing a high score here. Again, it's far from anything special, but I could really see young kids getting into this one the way they do their overly basic shows. And Thunder, at least, holds a slight hit of dopamine for us adults too, which feels like a long lost bit of childhood rediscovered. And that's the list. Odds are any games I've overlooked are simply in another one of my videos. But let me know your most obscure plats in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe for more content, because I never review the same game twice, you'll always be getting something fresh with these PSN previews.